grim picture of life on past, present, and future. The water short. Carbon dioxide levels will have more environmental disaster. Restored to ecological. And fish stocks are collapsing. The dirtiest gas leak and killer in summer is smog fish. Good evening, I'm Bob Hunter. Welcome to Hunter's Gatherings. Uh, most of us, I think, have probably driven along that really scenic stretch of Lake Superior shoreline near Wawa. Well, prepare to write that one off. According to environmentalists, it would seem that a proposed quarry smack dab in the middle of all that magnificent Group of Seven terrain is getting the covert backing of the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources, which has just done, according to environmentalists, again, a bit of maneuvering behind the scenes to ensure that an aggregate company won't have to face an environmental assessment. My first guest tonight will be Joni McGuffin famed outdoors person, canoeist, adventurer, author, who will be filling us in on what's happening at Michikapoten Township, where plans are going ahead to drill, blast, and crush rock for shipment to distant markets, leaving an immense scar on that famous shoreline. We'll also be talking to our own Harold Hossein about an upcoming automobile rally with a considerable difference, uh, namely that it will only involve uh, hi hybrid vehicles, the kind that use electricity as well as gasoline. I've driven one of these machines and it's like experiencing the next generation of ground travel. My third guest will be talking about allegations that Canada is failing to enforce the Fisheries Act. To round things off, uh, the negative side of high-tech automotive genius, four-wheel drives and how they're dusting up the atmosphere. Joni McGuffin, it's been a long time since we traveled to the Algoma Highlands together in search of truth. Welcome aboard. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Thanks for having me here. All right. I, I would have paddled here today if I'd had three weeks, because I can from Lake Superior get to Lake Ontario by canoe, but I had to drive here by the bus today, and it only take, took me a day. <laughs> okay, good enough. Well, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that you would be willing to spend three weeks paddling here to come yeah. on, <laughs> on the show. <laughs> but listen, we're talking about something uh, that's going on uh, along uh, uh, up towards Wawa. Uh, at Michipicoten uh, Township uh, that's, um, that, that you're not too happy about. And you're one of the people that really, really loves Lake Superior. We'll talk a bit more about one of your books after. Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess I could begin at the beginning, and I didn't start lightly there explaining that I could arrive by canoe, because what I'd really like all of your uh, watchers this evening to understand is that we are directly connected to the most amazing freshwater body on Earth. Lake Superior mm -hmm. is the largest of the Great Lakes, the greatest expanse of freshwater, and that is ours. As Ontario citizens, as Canadians, it is like the Rocky Mountains or the, the famed East Coast and the Bay of Fundy and all those kinds of places. That is what um, the North Shore of Lake Superior is to us. Um, in uh, 1999, Gary and I um, were made, in the year 2000, made champions of the coast under the Great Lakes Heritage Coast Program. Mm -hmm. And um, we felt the best way we could speak to being champions of the coast, because we're canoeists and writers and photographers, is to uh, paddle the coast and uh, do a photographic book about it. And that's what we did. And um, in, in, in that journey, in the midst of that journey, we arrived in Michigan Harbor in the summer of 2002 to a huge turmoil in that a thousand acres of our pristine Lake Superior coastline have been bought by an aggregates company, Carlos Companies, out of Michigan uh, to mine trap rock right on the shores of this lake in the heart of the Great Lakes Heritage Coast. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a very, um, you know, t tumultuous uh, time. It has been for two years. Um, and um, well, we're at a point right now where the Minister of Environment has courageously put it on the Environmental Bill of Rights. She received um, over the 6,000 responses to it, 5,000 of them asking for an environmental assessment, um, which will look at the full implications, social, economic and environment, of this um, trap rock mine proposal, um, proposed mine. Mm -hmm. Now what you're afraid of, of course, is that as, as things stand right now, the Ministry of Natural Resources has got its hand in there and, and they're trying to set it up a little differently? Yes, um, very surprising to us. Uh, we, we were uh, the guest speakers at the Federation of Ontario Naturalists, now known as Ontario Nature, their annual general meeting uh, this past spring. Uh, May 29th, we were at Black Creek Pioneer Village and we did our presentation on the Great Lakes Heritage Coast and uh, Minister David Ramsey was there and he spoke after us and very warmly about several important environmental issues facing Ontario and one of them was the Great Lakes Heritage Coast and that this government support was strongly behind it. Um, 
charting the course, which was the document guiding Great Lakes Heritage Coast, says that the number one priority of Great Lakes Heritage Coast is the restoration um, and protection of the ecosystem of the Great Lakes coastline. He spoke about um, meeting the municipal uh, governments along the shore and the municipalities. We are um, very, very excited about Great Lakes Heritage Coast. He told us in this speech uh, that they were warmly looking towards e an economy based on tourism. Mm -hmm. And um, so felt very, very, uh, with his words, that this government was strongly behind the real intent of Great Lakes Heritage Coast. So when um, uh, um, August 3rd rolled around, and uh, the Minister of Natural Resources, and it, this was not a public thing, there's been no public consultation on it. It was simply 12 townships adjacent to the Mishapakotan Township were designated under the Aggregate Resources Act. Now what might surprise people is that the Aggregate Resources Act only applies in Southern Ontario. Mm -hmm. It doesn't apply to Northern Ontario, and, I, and, and that was kind of a two-tiered thing there. It is an issue if there's an aggregate mine, yes, those, um, those um, the Aggregate Resources Act would str strongly help um, that community and those people um, in dealing with you know, the issues that surround having an aggregate mine. Mm -hmm. The point is that we have the most pristine freshwater coastline on earth. Right in the heart, the most magnificent gateway to this coast is at Mishapakotan Bay, where you've got Pakistan National Park to the west and you've yeah. got Lake Superior Provincial Park to the south. And um, an aggregate mine, what we have to look at here is we've got um, another opportunity. And an environmental assessment will be the only way to fully explore the, um, the, the true rationale behind this. Are there alternatives to this? Are there alternative methods to doing this? An Aggregate Resources Act does not deal with any of those things. It will only look at the, the aggregate mine itself. Mm -hmm. And as Canadians, I am, you know, as a Canadian, I don't want my pristine shoreline and neither should any of us want it shipped away to the United States to build roads um, or anywhere for that matter. Yeah. How much more can we pave over till we're a parking lot? Well, yeah, no, but, but it's also, we're talking now about the issue of a, of a shoreline, of, yes. a, of, a, of a historic, you know, I mean, it's all historic, of course, but. Mm. Uh, um, but it's not just some obscure corner tucked away. Uh. No, absolutely not. And uh, the champions of the coast consist of people, um, there's a number of us. Um, Pierre Burton is one of them, a major Canadian figure in history. Mm -hmm. um, we all signed on as champions of the coast for an environmental assessment. We have important assets in Mishapakotan Bay, such as the longest running fur trade post anywhere on Lake Superior that's never been developed as a, um, in the right kind of way for ecotourism right at the mouth of the River. We have a business there which operates kayak adventures in a big Voyager canoe. You can paddle on up, you could see where this takes place, just like old Fort William, similar in Thunder Bay, where they've really taken advantage and it's a strong tourism draw to understanding an amazing part of history that connects us with Hudson Bay and with the Great Lakes. So we have that piece that would be really undermined by having a big trap rock operation right across the bay. Yeah. And the, the other factor, I guess, that this now brings into play is that that is a most magnificent shoreline as you go all the way west and around to Pakistan. And when we uncovered a document in the, that the MNDM, Ministry of Northern Development... Now, what does that mean? Yeah, okay, yeah. Ministry of Northern yeah. Development and Mines produced this Ontario Geological Survey um, in 2001 when Charting the Course came out. Charting the Course says the protection and restoration of the ecosystem of the Great Lakes Coast is number one. This document maps out on that very same map of Lake Superior, all the strategic and important places for major aggregate operations. Greenstone, that particular rock, makes excellent asphalt and pavement. Right. And, and that they are looking at all the potential sites along the North Shore. So we are now opening the door with the Aggregate Resources Act applying to these 12 townships to not only Mishapakotan Bay and the thousand acres that this company has publicly said that they will mine the entire bit, but the company, Carlos Company, Superior Aggregates here in Canada, um, they have said that this is a 75 to 100 year operation. Ooh. If, if that's the case, then we're looking at something that is going to take the, the, our pristine coastline of Lake Superior, which we can never put back. We'll start with a big hole in the ground in Mishapakotan Bay, and it will, just, it will incrementally remove and take away the assets that we have 
to build on an, a strong ecotourism economy in Northern Ontario. Wow. Now listen, so one of the things that's a problem in all this, of course, are the comments by David Ramsey, <coughs> the Minister of Natural Resources, yeah. who's talked about uh, Mitchell Picotton Bay, the, 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 uh, an existing mining facility, as he puts it uh, there in the first place, and he talks very much as though it was just a little, little thing that's going to go on there, as opposed to a, a massive uh, century-long operation. Well, a very good point, Bob, because um, he's tried to, I, I feel it's been quite uh, you know, misleading because um, in an interview we heard on CBC Radio the other day, um, he, he says that um, this is a, it's just going to be used for the same thing it's always been used for. It has never been anything more than a port. When the mine operated in, in Wawa, it was five miles away from the lake and they, they sintered the ore there and it was brought by rail down to the lake and then it was shipped to the steel mill in Sault Ste. Marie. Some um, the shipping is what went on at that port. Right. That's all that was ever used for. And in fact, the company had to apply for a rezoning to even allow themselves to develop it as a trap rock mine there because it didn't have the right zoning. It has never been used industrially. And in fact, the company, the only little piece of that thousand acres that's been developed at all is the site where there's the old dock. Mm -hmm. um, the rest of the thousand acres is pristine wilderness. We will, that'll be clear cut and then it will be blasted, pulverized and, and it will be a processing facility for this company for years to come. And um, for a few mining jobs, we feel that northerners are t being taken as the third world again, that um, they'll go for this and what do they have left in the end? They have a big hole in the ground, there's issues around arsenic in the rock that can be draining into the water, there's the fishery there that's affected. There's a major caribou recovery program that will be affected drastically with this. And I'll come to the First Nations in a moment, too. Okay. <laughs> Tony, Tony I, 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 I'm, I'm thinking there's nothing really good about this. <laughs> well, I'd say the really good thing is that there's been a tremendous response to Minister Leona Dombrowski, who is our Minister of Environment, to asking for an environmental assessment. And we urge that minister and anyone who wants to help urge her to move forward with strength and vision that this is something for not just ourselves in the here and now. It is for our children, our grandchildren. In years to come, they deserve to be able to have this coast for something more than having it shipped away to drive cars on. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, undoubtedly. I mean, part of the problem, of course, is that uh, it's, it's, uh the, the, the critical part of the problem is the fact that we still have a growth-based economy. So, in fact, we need to build more roads. Now, I find it amazing that uh, we have a government, a provincial government, that has talked about uh, get, cutting back on sprawl, for instance, and has made a few good noises along that li those lines. But at, at the same time, here you are, uh, biting, chewing, blasting into a fantastic Canadian landscape. Uh, just so that we could put more cars on the road. Now this strikes me as the antithesis of, of, of anything green, that is, so far as I understand the word green. And here we have a, qu a quote from David Ramsey, the, uh, uh, the Natural Resources Minister, saying, I strongly support several projects now underway that will help protect the lands and waters of the Great Lakes Heritage Coast, for instance. Uh, he makes it sound, I am determined we will continue to pursue the protection and promotion of the coast. Well, this, if this is their idea of protection and, and, and promotion, <laughs> uh, uh, I'd like to see what, I'm glad they're not mad at the wilderness because they'd be, they'd be nuking it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we strongly urge, urge David Ramsey to take a trip to Mishapakotan if he already hasn't and to see what it is that this landscape is for all of Ontario and for Canada. And that um, we've been working both um, federally, provincially to build another um, a cornerstone for economy in the north. It doesn't always have to be based on removing our natural resources, from, um, whether it's mining, whether it's hydroelectric development, or it's forestry and, and industrial logging. What about tourism? We have a place second to none in the world. Hold that thought. That's two, I thought. Will. That's two thoughts we're holding <laughs> at the very least. Okay, maybe we'll get to a few more. When we return, we'll be talking more with Joni McGuffin. We'll also want to hear from you. So stick around. Dial 416-872-CP24. That's 416-872-2724. Or from outside the area, call us toll-free at 
863-CP24. You can fax us at 416-593-6397, or if you're on the internet, zap your thoughts through cyberspace to hunter at pulse24.com. Back to Hunter's Gatherings, we're taking your calls about plans for a quarry along the shores of Lake Superior. Here with me right now is Joni McGuffin, adventurer, canoeist, extraordinaire, photographer, writer, uh, and uh, right now somebody who's really upset about uh, what seems to be going ahead. Now, be before we get into a couple of other issues, one of them is, is how, <coughs> how imminent, how real is the threat? Are we, is this something that's going to happen in the next six months, year, five years? Um, I think the, the threat is very imminent. The fact that the Ministry of Natural Resources moved so quickly to designate those 12 townships without any public consultation at all, it says something about what's going on. Um, it, it's starting to include um, pristine parts of the coastline that uh, abut against um, not only Mishapakotten, the, the bay side, but also it will completely then surround uh, the First Nations community there, Mishapakotten First Nation. Uh, so we have a, a whole other angle on that and, and um, I think that um, we, we've been sitting here for two and a half years now. Um, the um, different steps have been taken, um, um, and we're now looking at uh, this thing will, will, will start very soon. If the, if the Minister of Environment will designate this for an environmental assessment, then we will be given the opportunity to look at the full ramifications, the full picture, and whether there's rationale for doing this, whether it's economically the best way to go for this part of the world, um, whether there are alternatives or alternative methods to doing this. So, Well, just generally speaking, the very concept seems uh, contrary to everything that this, uh, the, the provincial government presented itself as, or as the Liberals presented themselves as in the last election. It was supposed to be uh, having finally arrived at the point of some kind of green political consciousness. Uh, and then to turn around and start gouging uh, the, the Lake Superior, Superior shoreline uh, to build more bloody roads, um, frankly, drives me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, it drives us nuts, too. Um, the Great Lakes Heritage Coast was an incredibly visionary step to take. Whatever is, it is something that transcends different governments and people who worked within this program, um, uh, within government, um, were very excited about this because it, it, it united the municipalities, communities, First Nations communities. It unites the parks and protected places along a coast that is recognized by us all here in Ontario. Ontario goes from Port Severn on Georgian Bay, up the Georgian Bay coast, the North Channel, and all the way around the north shore of Lake Superior to the Minnesota-Ontario border. So 4,200 kilometers of coastline. But the, the thing about it is, it's, it's the unifying effect of it. And as you incrementally take apart the coast, you no longer have this pristine coast that we can access for all kinds of um, ecotourism opportunities, bringing people to live in northern communities, who could live anywhere in the world now, quite frankly, with the kind of communications we have. They're healthy, it's good air, good water. Um, we, we want to we open up the door to what all the other opportunities are. And I think a peoples that has a very good opportunity is, and, and here we've got some of the magnificent shoreline that we're talking about here. In the heart of this, um, this area is Mishapakotten First Nation. We were just down at a gathering of um, the elders and the youth um, to um, find strength in, in how, what role that they will play in this. Um, their land surrounds this thousand acres that this Carlos companies would mine. Um, they have every opportunity to have a very strong spiritual healing center. First Nations people need healing as much for physical healing as spiritual healing. And people came from Mississauga First Nation, they came from Pickmobert, they came from Six Nations, and said, this is a powerful place here. This is a very powerful place with the landscape of the forests and the rivers, only the sound of the lake. Because that is the thing we often don't experience as adults now. We see the landscape, but we can hear it when we're out there. It's just the sounds of nature. It's the air that you breathe. It's, it's all that sensory experience that you have in a spiritually uplifting place that helps us connect 
that, hey, my body is 70% water, so is your, the air we breathe is exchanged between us, the tree I look at, why should anyone be embarrassed to be a tree hugger? That tree gives us life, it literally breathes out our next fresh breath we will take yeah. and uh, so I mean First Nations people with their cultural history those that know it and can share it with other First Nations people can build that kind of strength in that community there and and we surely help to hope to help them do so yeah and also when you talk about a, a section of land being a native land and then uh, something in the middle of it being a quarry uh, I mean that, that's a, a, a division that we've created because because in fact that it, it's part of the same ecosystem and and if you're going to start blowing blowing these cliffs faces up and turning them into road roadway uh, this is going to have a huge impact on the on the surrounding ecosystem anyway I mean something lives there the blast site is within 800 meters of the nearest First Nations home okay and there is a, a, a bay side community that faces the site that's been there for years in fact there's a group of seven uh, cabin I think it was a I might be wrong about that one of the group of seven right. painters painted there in fact a, a famous Canadian painter lives there Valerie Palmer who does one wonderful paintings of people and the landscape of the North Shore and it's particularly Mishapakotan Bay. She's a treasure for all Canadians and, and um, we need these places and we need to look at why we should take them away for the short-term economic gain and not look at other alternatives to make an economy without having to take away. We yeah. can't put it back like a Disney World. No. It's gone, it's gone forever. Yeah. Now, what, 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 what's your thought on why it is the Ministry of Natural Resources uh, in the year 2004 uh, in Ontario would even consider such a thing? For one thing, it's just occurred to me, there's been an awful lot of trucks hauling an awful lot of rock along a long stretch of highway, which is, uh, apart from everything else, the greenhouse gas emissions from, from this kind of procedure are horrendous. Mm -hmm. uh, the impact on the highways, the, the, the whole business. I mean. What's going on there? Is it somebody shoveling money into somebody's pocket in the background or something? Well, I believe um, in the last um, decade, our, our consumption per capita for pavement for aggregate has doubled. Um, our use of the automobile doesn't seem to be getting less. It's, it's, um, it's a, a, a major factor that we have to deal with that we are all responsible for this because we are creating the demand for the asphalt and um, it, it, it our traditional gravel pits and those kinds of places we're running out of material in those places the United States um, laws are very stringent for this kind of mining and therefore coming to the North Shore of Lake Superior I think was a bit of a, a shoe in we'll go out there nobody lives there right. um, the local people mining has been their history and I feel very sad for the local people People because I think they've been kind of coerced into feeling that it's the jobs or in the mine uh, which is a very minimal number of jobs versus the environment and they play that out again and again and people it's like trying to see another a color that the economy of tourism and the right kind of tourism can be a good strong economy based on the four seasons and look at all the alternatives but until we really look at that and help people in the North Sea they only see oh we're gonna have this or this and they've got to make a choice yeah. and that's not fair to the people of Wawa who live the five miles away and, and, and many of them don't even know what this coast looks like either yes there's that that's one of the things now you certainly do the Great Lakes journey um, was is one of the one of the most beautiful books I've ever seen to make a long story short um, Thanks, Bob. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's quite true I mean I, I, I've looked at these pictures so often and uh, and they're, and they're mesmerizing and of course all the pictures do is they give us just a hint of, of what it's actually like to be out there this was a very special journey we did this in 2002 and we spent three months paddling that coast from the Pigeon River to Port Severn we took along a very special person with us it wasn't just my husband Gary and I but it was our three-year-old daughter who's okay. now five our children are our next generation. They are what First Nations communities teach us about the seven generations. And carrying Sila in that canoe with us and going on that voyage, this is the birthright of all of our children, is to have clean water, clean air. They aren't some ephemeral kind of idea out there. And so we paddled the coast, we come into communities, we come into these areas. And while we traveled, we carried a satellite phone, a laptop computer, and we kept in touch with the northern papers and the radio. Let people know about our own backyard. Yes, no, and it's such an incredible backyard. No, and it is one of the only ones in the world, but we'll hold that thought too. Okay. And Hunter's Gatherings will be right back. When we return, uh, we'll be taking some of your calls, so uh, hang in, give us a shout if you feel like it. Thanks, Bob. All right.
some new visuals in the background there. Welcome to Hunter's Gatherings. With me is Joni McGuffin, and we're taking your calls. We're talking about the hideous possibility of a major quarry uh, along uh, the uh, North Superior, Lake Superior, northern uh, shoreline near Wawa. Um, Joni, this is, this is um, was this something that kind of came up fairly quickly? You mentioned that just a couple of years ago you were going, you were paddling happily along there and suddenly discovered that, lo and behold, uh, things were not as they should be. Um, it is a, it's, a, it's a relatively new project. Yes, um, uh, the um, Algoma um, ACR railway um, sold off lands extensively in northern Ontario in our Algoma Highlands region. Um, I think it started about four years ago. I, I don't speak exactly to that, but it was around that time. And this piece of this thousand acres changed hands once, and then and then Carlos Companies bought it, and um, Superior Aggregates is the Canadian subsidiary of them. Right. So. Um, it, you know, it's one of those opportunities that it could have been bought by Canadians, but I guess nobody foresaw what the possibilities could have been here, and nobody knew. And we walked into the, the storm of it with uh, the citizens' concern for Michipacotton Bay. A small group of concerned citizens had um, gathered together in that summer of 2002 when we paddled the Great Lakes Heritage Coast, and they told us what was brewing there. And at the time, it was, it was the local, but now we now see this project as having definitely moved out into a more extensive region on the, the Lake Superior Coast. And at the time also, I don't think people were, they were just getting to understand Great Lakes Heritage Coast and what the possibilities for the future exist there. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so this all has a, a feeling of a giant uh, a step backwards uh, uh, from, from any, any conceivable notion of a, of a green future. <laughs> it, it certainly does because um, Great Lakes Heritage Coast was uh, one of the signature sites that came out of uh, the Lands for Life process and some people might have followed that, um, the, the new parks and protected places, but, but it was something different because it, of its size and its scope and the idea that um, our parks and protected places aren't just little, little blips on the landscape. Wow. You've got a park here, there's an island here and an island here and an island here. We can't think of our natural landscape in that way anymore. It underpins all of our life on Earth. And it is the conduit that flows between us, whether it's the, the rivers that connect the forest and out into the lake. I'm connected to you here um, by the air, by the water, and even by Lake Superior connecting to Lake Ontario. So that connectivity was very apparent in the Great Lakes um, Heritage Coast vision because it was a big idea. And it would transcend whatever government would come in next, it would be something that we would continue because it was good for Ontario, it was good for Canada. And uh, that is why we're very disappointed to see these kinds of developments because um, we would at least expect an environmental assessment from this government to see that the right things occur, that we look at all the, the ways of looking at this before we make such momentous decisions as to blow up uh, the Lake Superior coastline well, yeah, in Michigan, and, and, Cotton and, Bay. And like you say, once it's, uh, once it's done, it's done. I mean, uh, I, I do know what they do with these uh, aggregate sites is they come along and say, oh, we're going to put in some nice little ponds and we're going to plant a few flowers here and there and everything will be fine. Well, we know from our experience on the Niagara Escarpment it, uh, alone let alone the Caledon yeah. Hills, that in fact there are huge repercussions to doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, quite apart from the fact that you blow a massive hole in, in the middle of a pristine wilderness, you also leave, uh, the, 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 you, you mess with the water table for openers. Um, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not something you can do lightly. It isn't, and uh, we have to remember that it is right on the shores of the lake. Yeah. It's right on the shores of the lake, and the previous mining history, it's left a burn across the landscape that you can see from outer space, 15 miles to the north from Wawa, but that was five miles inland, but we're talking about right on the coast of Lake Superior. Yeah. Yeah. And as it incrementally would move along the coast, if the other opportunities open up, as we see the Aggregate Resources Act, it deals with those setbacks. It deals with compliances that the company must make. And they should have to comply to certain things. There was nothing in place to begin with. The company, the Mining Act, the Aggregate Resources Act, they didn't apply. And so they really had carte blanche over what they do with that thousand acres. That in itself was appalling to us, that this big American corporation could just come in, sit down and do this, and well, all they needed was that rezoning. Okay, so, let's let that, let's so, not go into the okay. free, free, free Trade <laughs> Act, uh, Mel Rooney, et cetera, et cetera. Sorry. Maureen from uh, Scarborough, you're on. Go ahead. Hi, good evening, Joni. Hi there. Hi, how are you tonight? Fine, thank you. Thanks for calling in. You're very welcome. Uh, Joni, I feel very passionate about this particular stretch of shoreline. 
I have family who uh, live up in that area, okay. and I visit it uh, at every opportunity, and I know the coast very well. Um, I think that the proposal by the company that you have described, uh, should it be permitted to go ahead um, uh, in an uncontrolled manner, would be devastating. What can we, as the average citizen, do to encourage or, or I guess, encourage the Minister of the Environment and the Minister of Natural Resources to designate this as an environmental assessment and uh, allow those proper studies to take place? Oh, I'd like to thank this caller very much for bringing this up because we always like to see that there's an action that we can take place. We see these things and then we feel frustrated. I would, um, first of all, there's a website, www.ccmb.ca, which is the Citizens Concern for Mishapacotton Bay.ca, ccmb.ca. That's a place to go first to find out about the issue, and there'll be contacts on there with the faxes, emails, and so on. I urge you to contact the Minister of Environment and everybody out there who's interested and to support having an environmental assessment. She needs us as citizens behind her right now. She needs to know that this is the voice of Ontario speaking. Our Premier needs to know this is what we want. The Minister of Natural Resources, I mean, the Aggregate Resources Act has its place, that's good. He needs to know what we really want done with the Great Lakes Heritage Coast. So um, if anybody can um, just, just send a fax, send an email, um, enormously supporting to your landscape as an Ontario citizen. Good stuff. Now, there. Um, thank you very much, Maureen. You're very welcome. Okay. Uh, so there's no excuse out there for not doing anything right now because uh, jo Joni has uh, uh, told us all. www.ccmb.ca. Yes, perfect. Okay. Um, I can read, too. Excellent. <laughs> Joni, uh, in all the years that you, you and Gary have been uh, paddling, uh, and, and, and of course the, the Lake Superior is, is like uh, is so close to your heart and soul. Um, uh, apart from a, a horrible example like this, this particular quarry, are things uh, um, uh, getting uh, better or worse? In a nutshell. Um. Oh, nutshells are always so hard. Yeah, um, they are. I, I like to think optimistically, Bob. I mean, I think Great Lakes Heritage Coast was a huge move towards understanding the connectivity that we have to all life out there and that we're connected. We're not just little communities in isolation. Um, uh, there's all kinds of things going on in this big world. Um, we're into the boreal forest last summer paddling around Lake Nipigon. Um, amazing um, area in itself, the wildlife that we saw, but get over the landscape to the north and east and you will be amazed it looks if you could if we had rocky mountains people would see the extensive clear cuts in northern ontario and our boreal forest faces huge pressures in in the in the years to come now uh, for you know we're starting to move into a landscape yeah. that will not recoup i'll take that as a yes and a no Joni <laughs> McGuffin, thank you very thank much thank you for, for having on. me bob Say it's hi. been great to see you we got to get out and paddle together again soon we will we will <laughs> Thanks very much, Jody. Okay, Hunter's Gatherings will be right back, and when we return, a her familiar face, Harold Hussein, and this time he's going to be talking about doing something about the weather. Stick around for that.